much of a distinction as people claim it is. Like liberalism has never had a problem with the idea of belonging and the idea that you should be that you can be proud of your country and proud of your of your um, of your town and where you come from, and express that in your own way. In fact, that sense of belonging matters to liberals because it matters to the individual. This this new idea that you know that we that, that patriotism is somehow reactionary or. Uh, you know, at, at the very least, just a bit regrettable. It has never really been a core part of liberal thinking and it's always been something that it's pushed against. And so the, I would say the Starmer attempt to articulate, and he's struggling a bit with it now, but, you know, fair enough, it, 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 he, got, he got dealt a sticky wicket. Like, his uh, attempt to articulate what that kind of progressive sense of belonging is, is A, perfectly compatible with liberalism, and B, I think, of absolutely central importance to make sure that nationalists and the populist right don't get to claim monopoly over the flag. And that was Ian Dunt. His book, How to Be a Liberal, is already out, and you can listen to the whole interview on my book club podcast on Friday. Coming up in a moment, though, it is Wednesday's edition of Cross Question. Uh, there's a lot to talk about tonight. You might have questions on the government reshuffle. Does it mean a restart of Boris Johnson's levelling up agenda, maybe? Uh, the, the protests on the M25, which have reoccurred today, you might have a question on that as well. Lots of other things to talk about, too, with Kevin Hollenreich. He is the Conservative MP for Thursk and Moulton, Lord Andrew Adonis, former Labour Cabinet Minister under Gordon Brown, Ella Whelan will be here from Spike Online, and Zach Polanski, Green Member of the Greater London Assembly. The number to call 0345 6060 973. And don't forget you can watch us on Global Player, the LBC website, or the LBC YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Feeds. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock. As a new education secretary off the back of today's cabinet reshuffle, it sees Gavin Williamson replaced by Nadim Zawahi. Justin Greening used to serve in the role and thinks Mr Williamson will be surprised he's been let go. I think he was education secretary d- during an incredibly difficult time but I also think he would accept that there were mistakes made. Liz Truss is also promoted. She's the new Foreign Secretary. After Dominic Raab was moved to Justice Secretary he's also now Deputy Prime Minister. Nadine Dorries is the new Culture Secretary and Michael Gove moves to Housing and Community Secretary and Marie Trevelyan has been made the International Trade Secretary. Boris Johnson set to make a security statement in a couple of hours' time alongside the leaders of America and Australia. It's being described by Downing Street as an on-camera address with US President Biden and Australian Prime Minister Morrison and we'll bring you that statement live here on LBC. In the city, the FTSE 100 closed down 17 points at 70.16. The pound buys $1.38 and €1.16. LBC weather, showery rain for northeast Scotland overnight, staying dry in most places though, lows of 12 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Kev McGraw. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross-question with Ian Dale. Hello, very good evening. It's Ian Dale with Cross Question. It's our third Cross Question of the week. Lots to talk about tonight. We've had a bit of a panel reshuffle. We thought we'd just emulate what the government is doing tonight. So we are joined by the Conservative MP for Thursk and Moulton, Kevin Hollingray. He's joining us via Zoom. Uh, Andrew Adonis will be here shortly. Um, I might tell you why he isn't here right now in just a moment. Ella Whelan is the organiser of the Battle of Ideas Festival and Zach Polanski is a Green Party member of the London Assembly. In case you're expecting Gillian Keegan, the Apprenticeships Minister, rather understandably, I suppose, the government withdrew all ministers from all media interviews today, but we're delighted to have Kevin with us in her place. So, the number to call, 0345 6060 973, if you'd like to ask our panel a question. And, of course, you can watch us on Global Player on the LBC website at lbc.co.uk or, indeed, the LBC Twitter, YouTube and Facebook feeds. 0345-6060-973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Right, first question from Mike in Beverly. Hello, Mike. 
Hi, Ian. Thanks for having me on. Welcome to the panel. Um, my question is, does the panel think that today's reshuffle is more about the next election than improving the government's performance today? Well, I guess all reshuffles are about improving performance and the next election, aren't they? Do, 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 which do you think it's, it's more about then? Um, I think that certain specific bits where um, the party co-chairman has been replaced is definitely organised at the next election. Um, removal of Gavin Williamson is again organised primarily at the next election because he's stuck by him faithfully when he shouldn't have done. Um, but coming up as the next election approaches, he considers it more important to run with public opinion, which is against Williamson. Um, so okay. I'm, I'm just wondering what the panel thinks, how political it is and how, it, how practical management of the government it, it is. Right, let's find out. Kevin Hollinray, let's come to you first. I don't know if you've been standing by your phone all day hoping hoping for the, for the call from number 10, but um, look, what reshuffles are all about sort of upping the government's game. Um, now, looking at the people who've been uh, ejected and looking at the people who've been appointed, do you think they've achieved that? Well, we all go into politics trying to make a difference and want to get things done. And well, I look at the promotions today particularly, uh, to the top jobs, I think it's really about people who get things done and prove they can get things done. I mean, that's not a reflection of the people who have been moved sideways or some 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 of them demoted, but um, some really good promotions. Nadine Zahar has done a fantastic job with the, the vaccine program. Um, Michael Gove, I worked for Michael on his PPS, or it was until today. Um, so uh, again, somebody who's is tremendous energy, tremendous at getting things done, and housing is probably the number one domestic economic priority in the UK for lots of people. Uh, Liz Trust did a great job in international trade, a bigger job in the Foreign Office, and lots of other uh, very good promotions. So really, it's a, a day of the doers, I think. In terms of making the government perform better, though, the opposition will say, well, it's just sh shifting all the chairs on the Titanic. You can put different people in different jobs, but if you've got the wrong policies, it's not going to make any difference. I mean, oppositions will always say that sort of thing. Um, but l let me just ask you about Michael Gove, because I think he, whatever you think of um, him and his policies, he is a transformational minister. He does Whatever department he goes into, he shakes up. And when he was at DEFRA, which, let's face it, is fairly way down the ladder in, in cabinet terms I mean he made it actually a really exciting department I think the civil servants actually loved having him as secretary of state for the, for that reason do you think that he is the one that can transform our house building prospects and actually make sure that there are enough houses over the next few years for, for people to live in yeah, I mean, in terms of the opposition, I mean, they would say that, wouldn't they? And, and we'd probably say something similar in opposition, if we were in opposition ourselves. Um, I, I have a lot of time for Rob Jenrick. I thought he brought some really good policies forward. The first homes policy, which is uh, homes for sale to people on lower incomes, that's a big discount, is a fantastic policy, the first homes policy. And uh, uh, so I think Rob did lots of good work in there, but I think Michael w is undoubtedly a reformer. I worked with him in DEFRA, as you say. There wasn't much going on. The pace of activity changed dramatically. He has this phrase, action this day, and it's always positive, it's always optimistic, it's always very can-do. He, he puts a lot of faith in the people around him, but you know things are going to happen with Michael in charge. Zach Polanski, um, now I'm going to, you can have your politi party political swipe if, if you like, but I want you to sort of also take on the role of political commentator here a, a little bit, because, I mean, reshuffles, to those of us in the Westminster Village, I mean, it's like Christmas Day, we, we love them. To, to the wider general public, I'm not sure that they really make an awful lot of difference. I mean, swapping ministers around... Does it make that much difference? Or do you, do you think that Michael Gove, whatever, I mean, obviously you're a political opponent of his, but I think you can recognise that he's one of the few people in Cabinet who can actually make a real difference. Yeah, I think he's strategic in a way that maybe other ministers aren't. I'm going to resist the temptation to condemn them all out of the gate. I think we need to wait and see what they do first. And essentially, we all live in the same country, so we've got to hope they do a good job. I think there's a wider point, though, about how chaotic reshuffles are. 
If you take someone like Robert Buckland, for instance, uh, I used to work in prisons, so I know how overcrowded they are. I know as Justice Minister, he was looking at um, bringing up rape persecutions. He was doing some really serious work, and now that's just gone. And instead, we get Dominic Raab, who probably should have been, you know, actually punished for being missing in action on Afghanistan. And supposedly, he got, he's got a demotion, but it's still a really important position. So in terms of what difference does it make to the public, I think the public need a government that's functioning. I think they need one that's operational. And right now, this government is uh, missing in action in lots of different ways. I'd love them to see, uh, for instance, DEFRA. You said it's fairly, you know, down the line. Don't know if you're just winding me up, um, but it well, often is. But it was. No, no, uh, absolutely. Before he went there, it was seen as one of the more junior jobs in cabinet, and he really ramped it up, didn't he? Agreed entirely. But it needs to be, you know, it needs to have more importance. In Spain, for instance, they have an uh, ecological minister. Uh, we need a minister for a green new deal. I think there's different positions that are really missing. I think if his government is serious about the agenda to deal with the climate emergency, then the position should reflect that. Ella Whelan. What do you think about it all today? Well, it's funny, you know, you don't want to sound like the kind of Christmas ruiner. I know that lots of people are treating today like Christmas Day and there's a lot of kind of salacious gossip that goes around this. Um, and not to sound like a Scrooge, but it is the case that there is a lot of bluster going on with the effects of the cabinet reshuffle and in actual fact the question of whether real people will feel an effect of Gove moving into that position in relation to housing, I'm very sceptical about because I remember when we had praise for Jenrick, I remember being on a panel with him on a radio show with Chi Onawara from Labour and the two of them squabbling about uh, how many hundred thousand houses each of them were going to build and it was just so narrow-minded, it was so limited in terms of understanding what actually needs to happen to have a revolution in, in housing and infrastructure more importantly in this country and the kind of big thinking you have to do and Gove is known for being the kind of, um, you know, the hard man who goes in and fixes problems. And he's very, uh, he's very experienced at that. But he's also going to be fighting with the fact that the Conservatives are very worried about their support among the blue wall and dealing with all the kind of nimbious traits of people who don't, you know, you know perhaps rightly so, don't want big houses being built in their backyards. So there's a lot of, there's not a huge amount of substance here, I really think. Most of the people who are in the main jobs have kept them. And when it comes to Rob, I mean, and, and Williamson, um, I think Mike made the point who rang in with the question that when it actually mattered, when Williamson was actually in a position of doing things wrong, when a, a, you know, a sacking or some kind of movement there would have sent a message to people about taking education and the pandemic seriously, they didn't do it. And so it does feel a little bit tokenistic. The real question is, in terms of people are talking about this in terms of the levelling up agenda, is whether the government is uh, serious enough, enough about dealing with what actually needs to happen with levelling up, which is getting serious in relation to moving into that new normal we've all heard about so much, or moving away from this sort of static normal of the pandemic with vaccine passports hanging over people's heads, with lockdowns um, being threatened. That is what's going to stop any kind of progress in terms of politics in anywhere outside of West Minister. Um, Kevin, t two appointments. Um, so, so, well, one slightly bemused me. One I thought was really interesting. Oliver Dowden becoming uh, co-chair of the Conservative Party. He's a policy wonk. Surely in the two years leading up to an election, you want a sort of rah, rah, rah campaigning type party chairman, don't you? And then secondly, Simon Clark, who's a name that our listeners may not be familiar with, but being made Chief Secretary of the Treasury, you're a Northern MP, he's a Northern MP, and that sends a signal that they are actually very serious about the levelling up agenda because he controls the Treasury purse strings. Yeah, I mean, I got a lot of time for Oliver, came in the same intake as, as I did, uh, really, really strong guy. Of course, elections are important. The uh, and the party machine is really important. Um, I think you're an excellent chairman of the party, and I'm, I'm sure he, it'll be another step down the road of, of very senior positions in government, Oliver. So um, um, I think in terms of Simon, yes, you're right. I mean, I think we are serious about levelling up. I mean, record amounts of investment. I know we talk records all the time. Infrastructure investment, 600 billion in this parliament is a huge amount of money going to be spent on infrastructure. It's not just that, it's where we're going to spend it. And previously, the way the formula worked, the Treasury formula worked, all the money, or vast majority got spent in London, the South East. For every pound spent in the North, three pound per person was spent in London, the South East. They've changed that formula. So there's the social aspects of our of the uh, of the country as well as the economic aspects, which we all mean a much greater proportion of that money will be spent on infrastructure projects in the north and the Midlands, for example, and the southwest and other areas that need it. Critically, this cannot just be about public about public sector investment. 
it's got to be about private sector investment. And that's why the government's put, put in place a super deduction, for example, to encourage businesses to invest. But really, more importantly, the free ports idea, which was Rishi Sunak's idea uh, when he was a backbencher, encouraging private sector investment. You've got to get the private sector investing as well. Leveling up will take decades the disparity in terms of economic disparity in relative terms between uh, London, the South East and the North East is as great as it was between East and West Germany before price reunification. And that took three decades and two trillion euros to narrow that gap. So we've got to be into the long haul, but in record investment and getting record investment for the private sector is absolutely critical. And we've got to make that difference as quickly as possible. Andrew Adonis joins us. Um, we, the question, Andrew, is from Mike in Beverly. He says, does the panel think today's reshuffle is aimed at winning the next election rather than making the government perform better? Well, the big change is the change of foreign secretary. And my reading of that, that's essentially a personality thing. My reading of it is that Boris Johnson just couldn't get on with Dominic Rabb. And that over Afghanistan and the, you know, Dominic being in uh, on holiday when it all happened and all that, their relationship broke down. So I don't actually think it's either of those. I don't think either Dominic Rabb or Liz Trust are household names in Beverly or anywhere else for that matter. And I think this is one of those reshuffles which you... You and I, Ian, know from having seen politics in the past, where this is basically about can the boss get on with the people he has to work with? And that relationship broke down and he felt he needed to do I'm not sure secretary. you're right on that. My, I mean, I, you may be right, but my understanding is that actually they get on quite well and that he, he had a real respect for Dominic Raab in the way that he handled it when he was in hospital last year. Um, and he may well have been irritated over Afghanistan. I don't, I don't deny that. But I, I, I think it may be overplaying it to say that their relationship has broken down. If it had, I suspect he'd be, he'd be out of the cabinet in full. But, I mean, you, you've been involved in reshuffles as an advisor in Downing Street, as a minister as well. What, what's it like being a cabinet minister when there's a reshuffle going on? Oh, it's totally frenetic. And, of course, you're... Uh, well, actually, in my case, because, curiously, I never thought in any of the reshuffles that happened when I was around I was going to be sacked. If you think you're on the... Of course not. It, no, well, Who would sack well, you? No, you know that that would never <laughs> have happened. But uh, if you're on the injury list then uh, I, I've seen people go around so haggard that, you know, you think their nearest and dearest have just died. I mean, it has mm. that effect on it. It's like, it's like a grieving process. But it also must be, and obviously this didn't happen to you, but Robert Jenrick, I mean, he could not have been more loyal to Boris Johnson over the last few years. He has also been a minister that they send out on the airwaves when there's a sticky wicket. He goes out and bats for them. And he's got the reward of being sacked today. Mind you, I think this tells you something about the sheer brass neck ruthlessness of our Prime Minister, that the people who have literally been there for him through thick and thin, in some ways Dominic Rabb had been as well, uh, he doesn't feel any sense of loyalty to them and uh, you can take whatever view you like well, of it. But he's promoted the Nadine Doris, who's his, been his biggest cheerleader over the years to the Cabinet, which I'm not sure many people saw that coming. No. Well, uh, I, I think that um, that's going to cause a lot of concern in media circles, <laughs> that particular appointment. But if you look at, if you're trying to look at this clinically, part of the reason why Boris Johnson is Prime Minister is that he has a level of ruthlessness which is above almost anyone in his generation, as well as, uh, as political skills. And we've seen it on display today. See, I'm going to push back on that as well, because I think his fatal flaw is that he likes to be liked. He doesn't like making enemies. And, uh, I mean, he has displayed ruthlessness today I in many ways, but I, he doesn't like reshuffles. I don't think any prime minister likes reshuffles because inevitably you create enemies. Well, he did delay the reshuffle quite a while. Just as, uh, you know, my, my dealings with him, I dealt with him closely when he was mayor of London and I was transport secretary and we had quite a close relationship. And I know as a, for a fact that he doesn't have a strong ideological view on the Brexit issue. He's been in favour of staying in the European Union, he's been against, he can see both sides. He wrote famously two articles in the Daily Telegraph. However, ultimately, he knows that in order to be a successful uh, leader and to marshal the troops behind him, he's got to make a choice. And when it comes to making the choice, he makes the totally ruthless choice. So the totally ruthless choice in 2016 was to come out against David Cameron, who after all he owed a great deal mm. to, who'd made him Mayor of London in many ways, totally ruthlessly came out against him on Brexit. And today he's come out pretty ruthlessly against some of the people who are closest to him. 
Well, it's all fascinating stuff. We'll take more questions on non-reshuffle subjects in just a moment. You're listening to Cross Question on LBC. We have Kevin Hollinrake, Conservative MP, Lord Andrew Adonis, Ella Whelan and Zach Polanski with us answering your questions. It's 18 minutes past eight. This is LBC. question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 22 minutes past eight. Let's go to Ben in Clacton for our next question. Hi, Ben. Hello, Ian. Yes, um, my question is, uh, Ian Duncan Smith was the architect of supplementary benefit. He was aimed to... No, no, no. You mean mean universal credit? Universal credit, sorry. Uh, Change there. Um, Yeah, universal credit. Um, He resigned as minister because uh, George Osborne uh, removed a large part of his budget for that particular um, benefit. Um, Was there enough money allocated then and now to make this benefit work? Wow, that's a difficult question. Um, Andrew, let's start with you. Well, I don't know is the answer because transitional issues on benefits reform are always huge. But the big issue that we're facing now is the debate about whether it should be cut or not. And you may remember that it was increased during the pandemic. And the issue now is whether it should revert to the the previous rate. And my view on this is that uh, we don't over provide for those people on very low levels of income in this country. And the benefit level has fallen well behind average earnings. And as a platform to see 
that uh, families with children are able to get on and actually do the things which families need to do, because remember there's also a two-child limit inside families as well, which limits the benefit level, to see that parents and families are, are properly provided for and can do the best to get them into work. My view is that it's pretty heartless now to engineer a cut from the level that's that's been in play for the last 18 months. But the government did say right from the start this was a temporary measure, but, but it's quite, it is quite difficult though to take away something that people have got used yes, to. Yes, but they'd already decided to keep it once. Remember, this is now one of those temporary measures that I think most people out there thought was permanent. What's actually going to happen is that people who are in the you know, in the in, in the experience of most people listening to this programme would be genuinely poor, are now going to get an an actual cash cut in their income. I'm I'm very surprised that Boris Johnson is doing it because he's normally pretty attuned to what the middle opinion, uh, middle England is thinking. I don't think middle England thinks that very poor people, when we're still coming out of a pandemic, should have their incomes cut. Ella, I think that's the crucial point that we, you know, I'm I think it's heartless is actually a good word for it um, I think it's uh, reminiscent of kind of nasty party tactics and it seems very tactless but also the fact the important point is that we are still coming out of the pandemic and crucially that the government is as I mentioned before threatening the prolong the prolongation of continuation of whether it be lockdowns or kind of restrictive measures or things that mean that people's lives aren't normal you know things that disruptions to schools disruption to work so if we were in a position where we were at absolutely back at the lives we were living in 2019, which, by the way, were pretty rubbish for most people, particularly for people who were on um, universal credit or at that income level. Uh, we might be having a different discussion, but when you have the continued threat of of disruption in people's lives that they have no control over, and you're, you've been spent, what is it now, 18 months in which lots of people will have been living on 80% of pay through furlough, which everyone seems to think is a great thing, and yes, I think furlough was a necessary move, but 80% of pay is 80% of pay, it's not 100%, and that means that it's had drastic changes to many people's lives and their security. To then whip that out from underneath them when everything is still up in the air just seems heart. it does seem heartless and it seems nasty. But the more important point, I think, is, and with the like, Labour government, and I'm, I'm with Keir Starmer, unusually, um, in criticising Boris Johnson on this. But what is, feels very depressing for those of us who have been interested in um, changing the benefit system or have been interested in arguing for more for um, not just poor people, but also working class people who aren't exactly on the breadline, is this measly kind of rowing over £20. I mean, £20 is, is really peanuts for many people, particularly if you've got a family, particularly if you've got... Um, people who are, as we've seen across the pandemic, whose care responsibilities have increased. I mean, it really is, this. if this is the state at which we're kind of discussing people's futures in the grand scheme of the kind of Tory plan to level up, it's rather depressing. The, the, the government would say, presumably, and Kevin may well come up with this argument in a second, that, well, it, you, you say £20, oh, that doesn't sound very much, but when you multiply it by the number of people who are on universal credit, it's five or £6 billion pounds a year. And given the amount of money that the government's spending, they've got to rein it in somehow. Yeah, I mean, and and the the argument has always been, where can we slice a little bit of the pie and deal it out somewhere else? Where can we tighten the purse strings here, loosen the belt there? And for you know, for working class people in that country, it's the same old, same old, and nothing changes. It's a it's a really kind of uh, it's a it's a really stagnant way of talking about what's very important to people, which is an you know the prospect of the future of the quality of their lives. If you have, if the most transformative thing you can think of for dealing with people's um, work opportunities for dealing with their wages for dealing with the amount of money they take home is rowing over 20 quid even if it does add up to quite a lot it doesn't say much for confidence in the conservative party who let's remember build themselves in the last election as the new party of the working class kevin you've been shaking your head a lot over the last few, few minutes um you're cruel and heartless listen nobody wants to reduce the amount of money that people on low incomes get particularly because it's been hardest hit but the the reality is, the wider you spread benefits, the more thinly they'll be spread. And this, you, what you're trying to do is, is focus benefits on those really, really in need. That, now that's pretty tough. What the Chancellor did uh, when the crisis hit, he knew that work opportunities would be reduced. So, so he raised that level that people would uh, guaranteed in terms of universal credit. But as you said, Ian, £6 billion pounds a year. Now, if we're going to spend that £6 billion, and I'm not against spending it, I just think we've got to very, have a very honest conversation with a taxpayer to say you're going to pay for it. Now, 
And how are you going to pay for it? So Andrew said earlier, well, your middle England doesn't want to cut the, the living standards of people on low incomes. Well, it also doesn't want to pay more tax. And that's what you're talking about. And the experience of Scotland shows, and they can vary their income tax rates now, when they tr try to raise more money, they had to hit everybody with that extra penny on income tax, people over 25,000 quid in earnings, which lots of people on this call would say isn't, isn't a high standard of living at that level. And this, the pressures on our balance in the books are getting tougher and tougher. The report by the Office of Budget Responsibility, because of demographics, say because of healthcare, pensions and social care, if we don't change our tax system and keep paying out what we're paying out now, our debt to GDP by 2060 will be 400% of GDP, not 100%. That's four times the current level. So that's nine trillion pounds in today's money. So we've got some really difficult conversations to have with the taxpayer about how we balance the books and but how we go I, to them and say, I, will, you, will you fund this? I suspect a lot of people on the panel might agree with some of that. But the point that I think people are making is that, well, why take it away from people who, by definition, if they're on universal credit, are at the bottom end of the income scale? 40% of people on universal credit, uh, it supplements their income from jobs that they already have, but for 60%, it, it does not. Um, aren't there other ways of raising £6 billion than just taking the money away from people who probably are the most deserving of it well possibly i'm i'm I say i'm happy to have that conversation but you've got to do it in the round you can't simply say here's another six billion pounds because you, know, you, you you know the ellen would would probably want lots to spend the money lots more money on lots of different areas as well it's not just the six billion pounds it's it's making difficult choices <clears throat> what what the conservative party did in the attempt to balance the books and Let's be straight about this. I think either government has not been great at this. I think we've balanced the books about five years in the last 40 years. So, and that's how we get, end up with two trillion pounds in debt, 2.2 trillion pounds in debt. What we decided to do is raise the minimum wage significantly and reduce taxation for those on lower incomes. So somebody who's on full-time living wage is now £5,400 a year better off than we were in 2010. So it's trying to make work pay, because that's the only way you can raise the living standards of those people you're talking about. That's what we should do. Okay. If we're going to spend £6 billion a year, I'd much rather reduce the taper rate of universal credit so you earn more, um, so you keep more of what you earn. That would be a better way to spend it, in my view, to make work, work pay okay. any, uh, even better. Zach Polanski. This is devastating to listen to. Kevin is a Conservative MP and he says no one wants to cut. But, you know, he'll go into the, that voting lobby and vote with the government. It was a choice to raise universal credit, a political choice. And I applaud the government for making that political choice. It's, it's a political choice, choice to now remove it. That's what they've done. Now, we could replace this with a universal basic income, which would uh, deal with a lot of these problems. I know it's slightly out of the scope of the question, but I think that would be a much more humane way uh, to treat society for everyone to get uh, a minimum amount that they can pay on rent and food and security. Well, that is another subject, but I understand why you brought it up. And thank you for being so concise. Um, Ella, did you, you just had a quick word? Yeah, I just, uh, it, the thing, the interesting thing is how this plays out with people, because what you've had throughout the pandemic, and actually remembering before the pandemic, do you remember when everyone was mocking, all these Tories were mocking Jeremy Corbyn for his magic money tree, and there was this real aversion to spending. And you've just had 18 months of vast government spending, lots of it I've welcomed, lots of it has been necessary. Money forest, not but, a tree. Yeah, an orchard, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> and, and what the message that sends to people is actually you don't have to tinker, you don't have to balance the books, you don't have to throttle people with cuts actually um, when you when you need to, when the pressure is on, when the political will is there. It just then seems odd that coming out of one of the most severe, as every single politician says, the most severe periods in recent history for working people and for working class people, for poor people, to then to whip the rug out from okay. under them. That just seems, that tells you something, I think. Um, thank you very much, Ben, for your question. We'll come to more questions in a moment. 0345 973 It's 8.32. And Kevin McGrath has the news headlines. There's a new education secretary off the back of today's cabinet reshuffle. It sees Gavin Williamson replaced by Nadim Zawahi. Liz Truss is also promoted. She's the new foreign secretary after Dominic Raab was moved to justice secretary. He's also now deputy prime minister. And Michael Goh's got a new or two. He's looking after housing. Boris Johnson's set to make a strategic national security statement at 10 tonight. 
He'll be joined virtually by US President Joe Biden and also Australian PM Scott Morrison and we'll bring you that statement live here on LBC. And the High Court's accepted a request to formally contact Prince Andrew about civil proceedings brought against him in the US. The court says it will now attempt to notify the Duke of York about the case brought by Virginia Dufresne. Andrew strongly denied sexually assaulting her when she was 17. LBC weather, showery rain for northeast Scotland overnight. Staying dry in most places there, looking at lows of 12 degrees. This is LBC. From Entre- Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 8.36. Let me reintroduce my panel. Kevin Hollenrake is Conservative MP for Thirsk and Moulton. Lord Andrew Adonis, former Transport Secretary under Gordon Brown. Ella Whelan is the organiser of the Battle of Ideas Festival. What is the Battle of Ideas Festival? It's a weekend of political and cultural and scientific and technological debate happening on the 9th and 10th of October. And we're taking over Church House in Westminster uh, this year. People's takeover of Westminster, <laughs> if you will. Um, and come along. Tickets are available and it's going to be, you know, over 60 70 debates on everything under the sun from Afghanistan to Bitcoin and we'd welcome you there. Yeah, it's when you get onto the technological bit, that's where I kind of... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Something for everyone. And uh, Zach Polanski is here. He's a Green Party member of the London Assembly. Right, James in Watford has an interesting question for us, I hope. James, hi. Uh, good evening. Um, does the panel feel like getting out of their car to congratulate Insulate Britain or to shout at them to get out of the road? <laughs> Ella? I think we should send in the Canning Town massive myself and pull them out of the way. I think that the, you know, I'm all for um, the, you know, stunts. I've done a few in my time, but a bit of street theatre, all that kind of thing. And I'm, obviously I'm very much in principle of for the freedom to protest. I think that as much as Extinction Rebellion annoy the hell out of most of us, um, those of us who understand the importance of protest should support their right to do it. However, it does make you sick defending them in that way, not just because I think so much of their politics 
demographics um, in terms of, the, of you know, being obsessed with a climate emergency is actually regressive and is about stopping progress rather than innovating our way out of the problem. But because, crucially, Extinction Rebellion do not care whether we get out of our cars and congratulate them or not. They're actually in, they are hostile to the idea of public um, support. They've said quite definitively in their demands that they that this is goes beyond politics. They've even sort of referenced stuff about the fact that you don't really need democracy to change things. You only need sort of three percent or whatever it is to um, push politicians to go in your way. They you know routinely have slogans like you know it, it's over panic. There is no debate. This isn't a discussion. And so they don't care. Not just they don't care what happens to the average Joe or Jane in their car stuck on the M25, cursing them because they can't get into their zero hours job. So you, are, are you saying they, they don't care whether they persuade any politician, or they don't persuade? They don't care if they persuade um, any motorist in the M25 of, of the righteousness of their cause. It's the motorists they don't care about. The politicians they've already convinced. I mean, we have already declared a climate emergency. You won't find any politician in government today who will countenance anything other than a kind of slavish um, bowing down to extinction no, rebellion my, my, and their my, my and their point causes. Is, if Kevin Hollenray could be an appointed uh, local government secretary today rather than Michael Gove, I doubt whether Kevin would be persuaded uh, to spend any more money on insulation of homes because of this protest. In fact, he might be very bloody minded and say, "Well, sod you, I'm going to half the bu- half the budget." Well, I mean, this is the other this is the other <laughs> point is that insulate um, Britain is arguing for something that really is actually in the grand scheme of things. This is the kind of uh, contradictory nature of much of the Extinction Rebellion movement and its offshoots is that you've been told that you have to panic and scream and roll around in the street dressed up in weird clothes because the, pl- the, the kind of planet is ending and then what they argue for is more insulation it's like you know it's it's actually a very unradical and as most kind of up you know people who are involved in innovating around um dealing with the environment a kind of paltry means of dealing with this so that i think the key point though is that when you have protests like this and i've been on many you what you really want to do is bring people with you and yeah. what extinction rebellion is actively doing is saying that they don't but care they didn't about at the people. beginning at the beginning they did bring people with them i think that's the interesting point now, a certain I, section of people and, andrew you you've been transport secretary i'm sure there must have been protests against things that you wanted to do i, I started hs2 so well you exactly can how many protests exactly. I've, had. I've been burnt in effigy if anyone else on the panel has been burnt in effigy but, but i had to go out to the back entrance of the department of transport do, they, they do these protests have any effect on cabinet ministers whatsoever yes of course they do And let's be clear, in a democracy, um, it's not the question of the motivation of the protesters which matters. People have a right to protest in a democracy. It is about being a democracy that people have a right to make their views known and to protest. But equally, it's perfectly right that we should limit the damage that they do to the public at large. And this is a very difficult judgment. You know, how much can you bring the traffic of central London to a halt or traffic going around to the M25 and this be regarded as a legitimate Uh, protest? And the answer is there isn't a science to this. You have to make a judgment. How do you balance people's right to protest and what their motivation is, is a matter for them, with uh, keeping the country going and not having people inconvenienced beyond a a reasonable degree? And I don't myself think that bringing the traffic of the M25 to a halt is acceptable. I think that we do need to keep the traffic moving. I do think people have a right to come to Trafalgar Square uh, outside Parliament. You know, my life is made very inconvenient because they come out right outside my office and often can't get out of the office when these big protests are held. But I think that that's a price which you should pay in a democracy. On this big underlying issue, though, do I think Extinction Rebellion is basically right about the climate emergency? I do. Let's be clear. The the science is unambiguous that we face a, a massive problem of global warming and that we need to cut carbon emissions dramatically. Now that's not to say there's only one way of doing it and there are a lot of ways of cutting carbon emissions but I do believe that moving towards net zero in a reasonable time frame is going to be important and I think we have a duty to see that our children and our grandchildren have a a planet that they can live on safely. Okay. Zach? Well, 2.4 million people are living in fuel poverty, so let's start there. This is a really serious issue. And actually, if we looked at making a big Green New Deal, we were talking about new jobs, new green jobs, and really innovating. This is about progressive uh, politics. It's not about regressive politics. It's about moving things forward through technology and innovation. Now, on the issue of protest, uh, we're talking a lot there about democracy. But the point is, we have a broken democracy in this country. We have a first-pass-for-post system, which the government today is talking about reinforcing 
They're even talking about rolling back proportional representation at some of the elections where we have it. We would be the first country in history to go back to a first-past-the-post system. And indeed, right now in Europe, it's only us and Belarus that have the first-past-the-post system. So what we badly need is a new democracy. Now, I'm in a very privileged position as an elected politician who chairs London's Environment Committee. I no longer need to go on sit and roads to be heard. I can be heard in the chamber. Did you used to? I, I've been arrested with extension rebellion. I think there's a really important principle there that actually, if democracy is broken and your voice doesn't count, we're in a climate emergency. I don't think it's commensurate to say, I agree there's a climate emergency and we need to do something, and this is a bit disruptive. Essentially, things are going to be a lot more disruptive when the climate emergency gets worse, just this week that's in a, London. That's a really lazy argument, though. Well, I don't think it's lazy. It? I mean, if you think on just yesterday, we saw flash floods in London. The science is now really clear yeah, that carbon emissions rising will create in more extreme decades, weather. frankly. Sorry? We've had flash floods in London for decades. They've been getting much worse, and now the Climate Change Committee report are absolutely linking the frequency of extreme weather and the frequency of flash floods with but, the rising but, but carbon some emissions. some of these M25 junctions, you've had literally 10 or 15 people bring the whole of the traffic to a halt and the police just stand there and do nothing initially for, for a few hours at any, any rate. Surely the motorist has a right and, and they, the protesters don't know what the individual person in the car is doing. I was on a programme yesterday with somebody who was caught up in the one in Windsor and she was having to get some urgent med medicine for her child. She couldn't get it. So they don't know what inconvenience they're causing. It might be that somebody arrives at their job late. Well, big deal. But for many people, that could be a life or death situation. The risk of sounding like the police commissioner, she always says this to us on the London Assembly, she can't comment on individual police operations. So I can't comment on this one individual because I wasn't there. I do think there's an important principle that if you're protesting, you should always leave a gap for emergency vehicles and, you know, things that need to really, really get through. But I think the bigger point is this. We were talking about infrastructure. We're spending £27.5 billion on new road infrastructure. This is why, while we've also declared a climate emergency, these two things can't match. Essentially, we need to stop burning fossil fuels. We need to stop you new road actually building. actually close the Rose network. You've still got to, even if you don't build any new motorways, you've still got to maintain the existing network. Well, so first of all, you've got to make sure there's no new things, and then you've got to stop burning new fossil fuels. Then we've got to look at the existing network, and we've got to look actually, how can we have better public transport, more frequent buses? How can we get people walking and cycling? How can we make sure that we're improving train infrastructure? All of those things are right there, and there are options here. And these options are good for the economy too. These aren't things we lose. There's no environmental justice without social, racial, and economic okay. justice too. And all of these things are intersectional, and actually, by improving our planet, we can improve people's lives too. Kevin. Yeah, I mean, I think it's self-defeating. You know, I, I, um, as a politician, and I've in my constituency, I've had some protests myself. You know, you can get as many. What politicians are worried about? If you're trying to change the government's perspective, if you're trying to change its policies, what, what individual MPs are worried about is getting re-elected. So, and that's the ballot box. And you can win as many votes by criticising this kind of protest as you can losing votes by, by not supporting it. So it's it's not going to change politicians' minds is the key. And as you said, because you know, you've know you got to feel that these protesters feel their priorities are more important than anybody else's priorities and they don't care about other priorities. So I think it's just the wrong way to go about things. I mean, of course, we need to do go further faster in terms of climate change, um, but we are leading the world. There's only one country, if you look at the Climate Change Performance Index, um, which is an independent report done by a German organization. We are second in the world behind Sweden in terms of our uh, our tackling of climate change and decarbonisation. Even so, we we contribute 1% to uh, global emissions, where China is 29%. So yes, we need to maintain that leadership role as we are doing, but we need to bring other people with us. That's how we do this. But I think this kind of unilateral action it's the tyranny of the minority. It's absolutely wrong. It's a disgrace. And I would like to see the police being a little bit firmer and a little bit quicker in terms of clearing this kind of protest. Um, Zach, do you recognise that survey that Kevin's no, talking absolutely about? absolutely not leading the way. What's being not taken into account there is aviation and shipping. And Greta Thunberg was absolutely right when she said this is creative carbon accounting. But, and, you but, know, this, but, really but this, uh, this survey presumably compared like with like, comparison. otherwise what was the point yeah, absolutely. of it? Absolutely. Well, but exactly, if you're going to have a proper comparison that's actually meaningful, then you've got to take into account everything. Yeah, but, Otherwise, but, it's but simply Sweden and other countries, they weren't taking it into account either. So uh, given, I mean, I understand the point you're making, but given that we come second, uh, excluding all of that, 
I mean, that's not a bad performance, is it? It's a petty performance. We outsource so much of our emissions to <laughs> okay. other countries and then to landfill. The, and Kevin see, knows this. And the, actually, when he trots problem, out that line, it's really bad the, the, for the planet. The problem is that if you just from time to time said, you know what, actually, we think the government's done quite well on this. And rather than just saying, no, we're all going to hell in a handcart and none of the policies that they've done is any uh, are any good. Surely that is, you, you're not going to win friends and influence no, people. No, I think there's a fair point there that, about finding ways to talk to the public and engage with Conservative politicians. And I think the London Assembly is a good example of that. I work closely with Conservative colleagues because it's proportional representation. We work collaboratively and actually there's Conservatives on the Assembly who get the climate emergency. They don't always have the right uh, solutions, but actually I'm glad that I can work Well, we did talk about electoral reform in the programme last night. We're not going to do it again, otherwise everyone always will, everyone will swi- switch off. And, Andrew, I'm going to move on because we're, we're running out of time. Just to say that Marjorie in Lowestoft wanted to ask a question on this. Her question was, why can't we use water cannon on the protesters? Very simple. We don't have any. It's 848. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player. It's the big COVID cabinet culling as Boris Johnson shuffles the pack. Out and now politically homeless ex-housing secretary Robert Jenrick. Out and bottom of the class Gavin Williamson. And back from the beach but out of his job Dominic Raab. In trading up from trade secretary to foreign secretary Liz Truss. In plotter in chief Michael Gove to housing. In delivering the jabs was just the job for Nadim Zahawi, who gets the tricky education brief. Everything you need to know about the winners, the losers, and the untold behind-the-scenes stories. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. With the British Airways American Express Accelerating Business Card. Check out the world. LBC. Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 
8.52, we were just talking in the break there, and I got a clinching argument against Zach's argument, but I now can't remember what it was. That's not true, it wasn't on the <laughs> uh, Text question next from Mary in Portsmouth. She says, when Shamima Begum says she's sorry from the bottom of her heart, why should we believe her? Now, for those of you who haven't heard this story, we are going to be talking about this after nine, by the way. Um, she appeared live on Good Morning Britain this morning, and um, she basically apologised for what she'd done. She wants to come back to this country. She wants to advise the government on how they can fight terrorism because she said Boris Johnson doesn't know what he's doing. I'm not sure that will have persuaded him to allow her back, but there we are. Um, Kevin Hollenrake, should Shamima Begum come back to this country? She was made stateless by Sajid Javid when he was Home Secretary. Um, surely we should have responsibility for what our citizens do and, and, um, t and, and take her back into the country. Well, we've got to comply with international law. And um, there's a fantastic film I'm sure you've seen, Ian, called The Mauritanian, which is really, uh, when we when we kind of don't comply or we change our principles unilaterally about something uh, that's politically convenient, I think um, I think we're into dangerous waters. So um, I think uh, if she is stateless, if there's nowhere else that she can go, then I think we probably do have to accept the fact that she's got to return here. It's not sort of something anybody would actually uh, prefer to see happen, but nevertheless, we've got to do something. Essentially what you're saying, it's a head versus heart thing, and I don't think anybody wants her back. But in the end, um, you can't really just render someone stateless, or can you, Andrew? Uh, I agree with what Kevin has just said, actually. I thought he was going to come in support of Sajid, but he didn't. He said that uh, if she is indeed stateless, then we have a duty because uh, she, we were the state to which she belonged previously. We do have a duty to, to take her back. And I agree with that. I do believe we should comply with international law. I don't believe it's an issue about what views people hold. Obviously, most members of the public would find the views that she previously subscribed to. We, I don't know how uh, honest her uh, recantation is, but the views she previously subscribed to were repugnant, you know, relating to serious terrorist outrages that are taken here and so on. But uh, we do have duties under international law. She was 15 when she left. We can't make people stateless unless there's uh, some reasonable basis for believing that they're going to be properly provided for. And if that's our duty under international law, we should honour it. Ella? I think that the, the most important question here is not necessarily the guilt or the um, redemption or, you know, the expressed redemption that she proclaims of, of Shamima Begum, but what the move of um, making her stateless said about citizenship and the fragile nature of citizenship and the way in which the government feel, is, feels able to play so fast and loose with it. I mean, the whole point of our opposition to... Uh, death cults like ISIS is that we have fundamental principles that we believe in democracy or supposedly are supposed to believe in democracy, free speech, a sense of what citizenship means and how important it is. And to watch the, I have to say, rather pantomime performance of both uh, Begum appearing on Good Morning Britain and then Sajid Javid coming out and doing this kind of, oh, well, if you'd seen what I'd seen, then you would do the same. It's just, it's incredibly bizarre, actually, to see um, a, you know, a senior politician acting like that and, and kind of not taking the public seriously. I mean, the, I think... This is riddled with controversies because, you know, the same people who say Shamima Begum was just a, you know, just a child, um, she's changed, how can we judge children, are the same people who are now talking about lowering the voting age or vaccines for children. And so there's the whole, the whole nature of what we think about children's ability to consent has been called into question. That's kind of a side issue. But more importantly, there's this sort of like warring camps of either you think that she was manipulated and that she is a victim and that you think, and th that that really we should be feeling sorry for her or she's this kind of demonic figure that I think the government has able to place as the one thing they're doing right in the in the kind of abstract war on terror. The one thing that they've got right is but that as far as they see it, is taking this hardline stance on Shamima Begum, one individual. When you look at the way in which we're dealing with, you know, um, I think racist policies like prevent, um, inactive and inefficient means of, of talking about the problem with Islamist terrorism, all these things that the government is getting wrong, they kind of are using Shamima Begum almost like this, this one example that, that they can hold up okay. and I think it doesn't wash with most people. Zach Polanski. Um, I agree with a lot of that. I think this is a question of democracy and upholding the law. So I think it's not about our personal opinions about one individual. But Sajid Javid did uphold the law. The Supreme Court said so. 
well, but the fact about making someone uh, stateless, I think we have a responsibility in law to make sure that, you know, if someone's our citizen, that we're treating them as our citizen. But that comes to the second point, and I accept this is complicated. It's about our humanity. It doesn't matter um, what we think of someone. Essentially, she came from this country. She's a product of some of the societal problems in this country, and now she wants to come back. And I think, ultimately, we have to look at those bigger questions of how did we create this problem for ourselves? What can we do to prevent this, uh, you know, further? And also, a lot of the points Ella made about, you know, looking at some of those structures and systems that are essentially racist and actually uh, reinforcing some of the systemic problems in our society. This is such a difficult question, and we, we've talked about it on the programme many times over the years. Uh, and so, I remember somebody saying, look, basically, she was brainwashed into a cult. If, if she had been in this country and, and a cult had recruited her, we would have every sympathy with her, and we would be trying to sort of de-brain... I don't know, you can't de-brainwash someone, you, you know what I mean. And yet, because it, it's got the ISIS element to it, we somehow treat this very differently. Um, Kevin, do you, do you think that brainwashing is a good enough explanation? <coughs> she was a child. It's, it's yeah, it's a difficult one, Ian. And um, but I think the international law point is the key point. You know, we, we have to comply with international law. It's a good point you make about the Supreme Court. Um, so, um, but, um, you know, I don't except that this is a domestic problem, as Zach suggested it was. This is an international problem. It's an ideological problem. It's one we have to try and defeat on a much uh, wider level um, and uh, work, work with international partners because, as we've seen in recent events in Afghanistan, you know, this is an ideology that um, mm. is so contrary to, to our beliefs. Um, so, um, so it's very important that we do, we do work together to defeat that kind of ideology. But... Um, Yes, I mean it's very difficult to try and say whether whether it was a brainwashing okay. thing or, or something completely different. Ella, brief point. I think part of the problem is that you have, in a broader discussion about how to deal with and talk about Islamist terror, a real nervousness about actually calling the beast what it is and talking about the way in which, um, I mean, that made the point about the problems we have with homegrown terrorism and the reasons why people like Shamima Begum, you know, a young girl with all opportunities ahead of her, decides to join a death cult. I mean, no one's asking the question of what, never mind what she believes now and whether or not she is, you know, wearing her nightcap and looking very nice and all these things. It doesn't exactly pull on the heartstrings of the British public who have seen their fellow citizens die at the hands of terrorists who she supported. She supported at one point the Manchester bomber and set, you know, supported which the, recanted. which she's now recanted. But the question is, are we going to get serious about not just Shamim and Bacon, but talking about okay. what it is that Islamist terror involves? Um, now we have a final text question from Julie in Lowestoft. Second contact from Lowestoft this evening. Um, if you got a call from Downing Street this evening, which cabinet role would you want to take? Now, I think, Zach, I can guess yours. Are you going to surprise us and say that you'd like to be Chief Secretary to the Treasury? Uh, no, but I, I might surprise you. I've, environment was what came to mind first of all, but then I thought, actually, electoral reform, given everything we've said tonight, change the voting system, we'll have more Greens, and actually we can get more Greens into important ministry positions. So you want to be Home Secretary, basically? That'll Hello. do. Uh, I think I'd probably be safest since, as Culture Secretary, I'd take Nadine Dory's job, but... I suspect that, like Nadine, I don't know very much about sport. And that's the real killer, the Achilles heel. That I'd be able to wax lyrical about books, but when it came to football, I'd find myself in a difficult position. Or tennis now. I texted Nadine this afternoon. I said, you know, if I didn't love my job so much, I'd offer to be your special advisor, particularly for the free <laughs> tickets for sporting events. Andrew, uh, I nearly said Andrew Lansley then. Andrew Adonis. <laughs> <laughs> this one's an easy one for me. Obviously, I'd like to be Transport Secretary again so I could get the trains running on time because they have stopped running on time yeah, since I did the job, you know. Well, yeah. they didn't run on time when you no, were They transport. were perfectly on time. Oh, OK. It's right. been 10 years of degeneration. Um, Kevin Hollingrake, I imagine you'd like to snatch Michael Gove's job off him. <laughs> well, it might be something in, in housing. I've been in housing most of my life, actually, prior to being in Parliament. Um, 30 years in that, uh, doing that kind of work. So, uh, which is probably why the, one of the very good reasons why I, I wouldn't be offered that position, perhaps. But um, yes, that would be, it's a, it's a great brief, and I'm sure Michael will do a great job at it. What about you, Ian? Um, Transport Secretary. Yeah. Andrew and I have discussed this before. That would be my dream job. When I'm Lord Dale, as you became Transport Secretary and you Lord Ad Adonis, you, you have set the precedent, so I haven't quite th given There is a hope. difference, though, Ian. They called me the thin controller. 
I you, beg what, your what, pardon. What, you <laughs> just, what are you what, suggesting? What do you think they were calling? Honestly, you? he arrives late for the programme and then insults the host. He's never going to be invited back, is he? Now, next week on Cross Question, we have John McDonald, Polly Toynbee, Andrea Ledsom, Alex Salmon, Simon Marks, our US correspondent, and the Conservative MP, Joyce, Joy Morrissey, among others. Uh, thanks to Zach Polanski, Ella Whelan, Andrew Adonis, and particularly to Kevin Holland Rake for being a great super sub. He's going to be known as the David Fairclough of Cross Question. And if you're a fan of 70s football, you'll understand what I'm saying there. Uh, in a moment, we're going to get take your calls on Shamima Begum. Should she be forgiven as she wants to be? Should she be allowed to come back to the country? 0345 6060 973. This is LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's three minutes past nine. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 9.03, a major reshuffle of the Prime Minister's top team sees Liz Truss made Foreign Secretary and Nadim Zahawi made the new Education Secretary. He replaces Gavin Williamson, who leaves the government. Jeff Barton's General Secretary of the Association of School and College Leaders. He's been